Okay, it's ready, it's on. Okay, James Harris, Superintendent. Carol Bites. David Rathkip. Mary Beth Kiesel. And Connor Kirk should be getting here in about 10 minutes. So get going. Oh, well. Mrs. Evans. <laughs> Mr. Repco. Mr. Repco and Mr. Hurley are also here, and Mr. Basil's kind of hanging out in the back. As a member of the honor, public. Our member of the public. Member of the public. Uh, let's see here. Um, so, Carol, you'll wait till uh, Connor gets here for your presentation? Please. Thank you. And then, I guess we're, we're still with the textbook review, review process. So, this uh, is about the. Okay. So, um, actually, I did have one question on this because it um, actually kind of stems out from the uh, Finance Committee meeting we had the other night. Uh, because uh, uh, Dane had, had his budget for the ABC had put in there to for some technology, whether that's Chromebooks or whatever that was. It, 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 his, his words were was un, un, unspecified, left up in the air. He was going to consult with uh, you know, technology and see what's what. I mean, it, it, that's fine, but in my mind, it, it, that kind of ties into our, our textbooks. He's going to be using the, those as a substitute, and it could be a, it could be a wash in cost. Um, but I think we kind of need to tie tie that in. And then instead of us him asking for money to get stuff, mm -hmm. we should probably come from a curriculum point of view and say, here's where we're going to start, and then if the money makes sense, then we could kind of go forward with that. But kind of, I think we're kind of doing it backwards here. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Perfect segue. Right? Segue two. <laughs> Thank you. But so no, that was um, that, uh, there was no, no feeding here at all. I don't need to eat this, do I? Yes. Just Thank speak you. loud so we can record it. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind giving you the speaker that. I'm sorry, I can see you there. In hearing? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I did was meet with the elementary principals and um, share kind of the same sentiments that you really need to look at this from a district perspective as opposed to this building versus this building versus this building. And I think we had a very quick meeting and we came to a consensus that um, we believe that they want some science, either materials or text or something, but what they really need the priority should be their, their curriculum, which hasn't been revised for, I'm trying to think, Mrs. Trainer did it right before she left, maybe a year or two before she left, she re retired. So um, the good news is the science standards have not changed that much. They are not aligned to PA core like ELA and math is. So we are using the science, the national science standards and the common core science standards is what uh, most people use. So we're going to work on aligning the science curriculum, the instruction, and the assessments, K through five. And we have a timeline for that. Um, we expect to complete it by the end of March. So, um, and because they already have faucets that they that they really like and that they believe the teachers really like as well, we're leaning more towards incorporating those faucet kits. And yeah, that's not right there. What was well, that oh, sorry, <laughs> a faucet kit is kind of like um, a, a box of supplies for the inquiry-based 
science approach. So um, I haven't used one in several years, but okay. it's it's a big kit, and it comes along with other materials. I mean, you can spend as little or as much as you want. They they are costly, um, but I think we're in the preliminary stages, and I think the priority should be the curriculum. So. They've already have some FOSS kits, these science kits that they share at each of the elementary schools and the and Birdsboro. Monopoly does not have any. They have the K-2 kids. Um, and we would like to add to the existing kits that we have. So that would be one thing we're looking at. The other thing, like I said, is more of a blended learning uh, forum where through the curriculum writing, we'll be citing free online resources and materials through the curriculum apps, such as, I don't know if you're familiar with Engage New York or Washington State has free resources. NASA has free resources. Nat Geo. Um, we have a license to discover education through the technology department. So we are going to be incorporating a lot of those resources simply because they're great resources and free in the curriculum. Okay, okay so what, <clears throat> to basically answer your question, instead of going with textbooks for the next year, we're going to do a blended learning approach. Mm -hmm. The blended learning approach will take online technical resources and FOSS kits. FOSS kits are a big box of grab bag goodie of science, hands-on experiments. So instead of reading it, in a book or reading about it online, the students will be able to be hands-on. There's different types of FOSS kits, all, all different levels, and we're going to be expanding on those. So I take my baking soda and vinegar and poof, there you go. There you have a volcano. I still have one at home somewhere. So instead of investing in the textbooks, aligning the curriculum to online resources. NASA, Nat Geo. Yeah, that's a lot more a fun way to learn too. Yeah. Yes. Right. So the textbooks, it won't be outdated. So aligning the curriculum and the core standards and using the online resources. So it's the best of both worlds. There'll be handouts and written material that's created by us here internally, but using the online resources. So, so creating the, a blended. The online will be done in the classroom. We're not going to have their own. Yes. Uh, in the classroom and can be done at home. Just, right. We're not investing in the hardware yet. What's happening is I met with the IT folks, and we're going to be building up the infrastructure so in a, in a few years we can go with the greater hardware. Right now, it'll just be cycling. We, we, we don't have the bandwidth right now to give everybody that. So we're going to be, and also we'll be working from the top down, high school down to elementary. It makes no sense right now to give it to a third grader or a fifth grader, and when they get to the middle school, it's not there yet. So when we roll it, when we roll it out, the hardware, we're rolling it out at the high school level and going down. So as the Maybe students, right. So that's what we really agreed on. And all the principals, elementary size, have agreed on that's the way to go. Right now, we're just looking at aligning the curriculum and any online resources and creating the model. And we do have, I did put some science binders over there that this trainer had created. And we have those K through, I don't know if it's five or eight, but it's a good beginning point for, for science. So that's what the binders are what the um, schools have been using so far? Right well, currently, or recently? I know it's available. I, I you know at this point, I'm not sure what they were using. So we're going to. Um, we're going to give them. Going to standardize that at this point. Yes, and update the binders. Got it. Okay. And we'll be getting some numbers. I guess the numbers for these things will be going to the finance. How many FOSS kits you're looking for? And the yes. The are you still looking at that, or do you have numbers? Working on that now because some of the buildings had FOSS kits, unbeknownst <coughs> to us. So they okay. th they were ordering them. Right. Okay. And what we're looking at doing is aligning all three schools. We don't want one school to be ahead or behind right. the other. Okay. So in meeting with the staff together, we looked at the resources that each school had 
and also what we need to do to get them all standardized. Also looking at professional development across schools instead of just having one school go out for PD and coming back and implementing it where the other two are left behind, mm -hmm. aligning those also. When, when there's PD available, professional development available, mm -hmm. there's a representative from each school can attend and then take that back. So it's basically train the trainer technique and bring it back to the schools. What are the national standards that you referenced? Um, Mrs. Keesley said we'll be aligning the curriculum. They're the common standards. Common standards. standards. And there's national science standards. National science standards, thank you. And um, we're, we're talking about K to 5 being done in March, and that's all good stuff. Would the next logical step be middle school in the next yes. year? Yes. Try to get this done in three years. Like we, talk, we talked about piloting it, but that really wouldn't work. We need to roll it out and roll it out evenly because it takes time to learn it. So we don't want one group to be ahead of the other. So we're gonna roll it out and then as we grow, we're gonna bring it up in grades because this will follow the student. So it's a way for them to learn when they're young and it's easier to learn when they're young. <laughs> okay, thank you. The other thing while we're still on the curriculum is that Mr. Curtis brought this up. Uh, I know we've slightly talked about this before and it might actually be a contractual issue as well as uh, an individual school district issue. Um, but you know when we, we do pre writing, we all do it at the individual school level as opposed to the five our districts you know, coming together to try and, and uh, whether you're, you're saving costs or you know so instead of each individual district doing a pre writing, is there you know a way to actually combine so you know, it might be a contractual issue, one, one item, but uh, since, you know, I thought maybe the first step, since you're going to be at the, uh, spend some time at the IU, um, maybe first looking at it as a county, county level with, with, with the IU, maybe there's some way to, I know the IU does something frequently, uh, frequently right as well, but maybe there's a way to get districts in the county can somehow come together first. <laughs> well, the first thing we had to do is get ourselves aligned with each other, what we found were we weren't aligned internally. So then once we have some alignment, then we can go to the IU and say, okay, this is where we are, this is where we would like to be, because currently we're not aligned. And you saw during the budget meetings when one teacher, one principal said, I want these books, and the other says, well, I'm going technology. We were like, hold on, let's agree on what we're going to go use going forward. So once we have that plan of attack, which I think we have t today solved, then we could work on building a curriculum, aligning it, and then, okay, IU, how can you take us to the next step? What are the best practices done by our peers out there in the county? I, I, heard I hear what you're saying, right. yeah. 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 But I guess it's it's, it seems, seems a little, you know, we, we have all these districts and it seems like we uh, have a location of uh, effort. Yeah. effort uh, and, and I feel the same way, but I guess it's not. I agree. It's not Okay, so anything else on that right now for textbook review? Um, I have created a document that illustrates what the absolute priority text would be that I'd like to share with the committee. Um, I might just pass them around if you'd like one. You have one. And I, yes. I have all the materials related to curriculum in that binder that Mr. Rapp yeah, can share with you. So it's been a, a long year of going back and forth between department chairs and budgets, and this is what I thought would be the um, priority for this year. And what I do is met with the department chairs and principals. So at the high school level, I'd meet with the department chairs and with the principal, Mr. McKnight. Um, at the middle school, I would meet with Jenny Rexroad and elementary with the principals. You can see the bulk of the cost is coming from high school textbooks and materials. Does everybody have one?
Did you get one? Yep. Let me see it. So you can, it's really kind of... Mary Beth. I mean, it's really kind of telling you to all the different classes we had at the high school. And, and, and we're, we're attacking, what, five, five of them? Uh, five of them? Pardon me? So it's, just, it's just telling you have, you have all these classes at the high school, and we're only attacking five, five classes. And that's plus of us. I mean, we can work with textbook companies and get the best price, but these are based on quotes from the companies and the resources that we're seeking. So you can see that textbooks are expensive. And this is the whole nine yards for shipping and handling and the book itself. I believe so. Like $125 a book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can also go through the list and tell you the rationale. <laughs> Do you want to know the rationale behind ordering sure. each book? Yeah. I say we open up our own publishing house. <laughs> yeah. Or two head districts for the right? Yeah, we can go all, all around, all, all year around school, then we can uh, share with the district, right? We can do one in the winter. Okay. I have lots of documents here. Please forgive me. I'll take you a minute. And how about the, the quantity of 350? 315. Was that based so on this year's enrollment? Is that a good I believe, number projected out? I asked them to do the projection, so I believe that is those are projected numbers. And I'll say history economics, and so that's the academic level. The multiple the kids would read in 10th grade. Yes. Why? Because we have yes. Oh, history. in this binder as well are those forms that I created. Mm -hmm. So you can, you know, they have all the information in them. Okay, okay. great. Great. Um, great. Thank and, you. and yeah, these so these are all the same uh, as I think um, uh, Mr. Mr. Mike said. We have four different algebra books for algebra two, but it's all algebra two. It's why we have four different books. Yes. So these these are going to be across the, the spectrum of, of level of the child. Well, what we've done is D level, yeah. so that we're just yeah. going to have one for all. One book for. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Except for AP. Let's see, uh, the economics books, I believe they are currently sharing. Mr. Harley, do you have that document that I have that was the rationale for each of the purchases? History. We'll start there. The books are just outdated. They were published between 1992 and 1994. Um, and so they're requesting to have those replaced. Which publisher do they want to go with? It? Is that, was that on the forms I could look at later? It is. That's fine. Uh, 12th grade economics. The, the reason that the chair sent me is that they were outdated. So the chair would send me the request and I'd sit with the building principal and he would sign off on the document as well, meaning that he was in agreement with that. And the biology... Did you give any specifics of why it's outdated? Outdated. Biology books? Maybe we just put out capitalism. We love numbers. <laughs> It's a it's like over there, so if you want to look at okay. the, the right. ones that okay, so the biology books um, are really a priority because they are in very poor condition and they're not aligned to the Keystone exam. And if you look at our student achievement uh, in the Keystone exam, biology is very discouraging. So we're hoping that uh, the books aren't aren't giving you stuff to the test. Yep. So that's the reason that's a priority. 
The earth and space science books at the high school, <clears throat> the reason that I think it was just 60 books is because students are currently sharing the books that they have. So they don't earth and space science is, is uh, optional science, correct? I mean, they take it as opposed to taking uh, harder science. Am I, am I thinking that correctly? Earth science. Earth science. They will second year camera I think everyone takes Earth. Is that right? Earth? I think so. And um, they just don't have enough books. They're sharing books. So this is so this is the same. That's adding six books. So same same book. Same book. Kind of. I Uh, let's go. Uh, the accounting. Excuse me. Can we make a note at 1825, Mr. Kurtz, join, join the meeting? Thank you, Mrs. Bites. Are we on Sorry, item one still on textbook review? Yes. Okay. Okay. And we're down to, um, I can share this with you. We're down to accounting. And what the accounting teacher has said was the materials are so outdated that they just don't do business that way anymore, and it's really hard to prepare kids for yeah, the accounting rules are always kind of on paper. Right, so. and so that's what that is. So those yes. that explains the requests for the high school. So that that's just doesn't say how much that covers the whole class. That, yes. That and it co it covers some online materials. As yeah. Well. And I did put those. Now, are those online materials that are interwoven into the curriculum? Because I know, just for example, in college, sometimes we have to pay for the online component, but then the professor never assigns anything to the online component. I this think it's will, for the students. Yeah, it'll be, well, that's what I'm saying. Their students will actually be using it. It yes. won't just be an extra cost that we're paying. Any more questions on the high school? Okay, we'll go to the in terms of coming up with these prices, how did you find them? Did you, was it, like what was the process for comparing the prices? Usually the business office, we, we work with the business office. Okay. And, um, but we did check with a couple of companies before we could. And we actually, the business office will have the ISBN numbers so that they can do. And they can compare all right. of the okay. Going to the middle school. Going to have a publishing firm. That's there we go. So, give us a I think we can make some money off of it. I don't oh, think he's going to give us a discount. This is a huge. <laughs> <Not anymore. laughs> I don't think he's, gonna, he's looking like. No. This is a huge market. I think there are four companies, four firms that control the entire textbook industry. A lot of money. California, Texas. Yeah. It's like hundred million dollars. Yeah, it's crazy. There's some room for innovation there. If anybody wants to make a lot well, of money. And I think you have to remember, I'm not, at the high school, I think they're especially valuable and important. But a textbook is a tool to your curriculum. In my opinion, the most important thing is a good curriculum. We're not denying textbooks are a necessary tool. It does seem that this is one of those areas where you look at, for example, in the English language and the English language are the same companies. Uber comes in, taxing their prices. You know, so it's just one of those things that it's a it's a it's a controlled market, yeah. and and uh, there can be a lot more economies of depreciation. All right, moving on then to, to middle school. Or are we just going through these item by item? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the middle school is seeking pre-algebra, excuse me, pre-algebra book. Um, the reason is that the book they're using is not currently aligned to the PA4 standards. When your book is not aligned, um, the kids, you know, struggle. Unfortunately, I think a lot of this comes from mandates, you know, and then mandates. we're expected, Sorry. right, um, we're expected to find the resources we need. So that's the story with the middle school, and that's all that they have requested. That, well, no, that's the priority. And at the elementary school, um, we had the discussion earlier that so this, this is the price for those kids. 
Um, that's kind of a placeholder that we would like to put in there, uh, whether we order including kits. Uh, they also have the Pennsylvania standards for ELA include the connection between English language arts and science, and then English language arts and social studies, so that you're integrating writing and close reading in the content areas. Mm -hmm. So maybe some little trade books that you know would spark kids' interest, that kind of thing. So that is the, um, that's the list. Does funding come for any other source for this? No. Title all of our Title One funds go to K through two at the Okay. Will so for tenth grade history, now I know the standard I guess is like when I was in school for the most part, I'd say there were exceptions. We had the textbook, and we took it home with us. We had it in our locker. Actually, we kept it in our locker board when we took it home with us. Um, is there any merit to having, instead of one, one textbook for each student, one textbook for like a classroom textbook? Like if the classroom has 30 desks, 30 textbooks, and they use it in class, and if there's a section they need something from, they can go make a photocopy of that, those few pages, if they're doing a report, for example. Is there? Merit to that idea, or do our students do they take home the textbooks? Still, do they do they do they need them outside the classroom? Is what I'm getting at. The reason that I was giving was that the books were published between 1992 and 1994. Yeah, I mean that's a different yeah, question. But the question was, it was just order, instead of ordering 315, we ordered just enough for, for the for that class. Well, that, that teacher, teacher might have. Sections. Yeah, you know, if we have three teachers teaching 10th grade history, maybe we order, need to order 90. Mm -hmm. But that's still a whole lot less than 315. Mm -hmm. So you're saying order classroom sets yeah. instead yeah. of the individual sets. That's, some, know, that's something I'm looking so into. And you know, you could even you could set up a cycle. Like if you do need to take a textbook home, then on Monday this class will take it. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday this class will take mm -hmm. it. That could be a way to, to save significant money. That's something worth yeah, looking into. Might need to have a few extra with the kids to get to bring them back in. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it gets to the point of what are we doing with the textbooks? What is the purpose of having a textbook in the 21st century? Well, I think it's more important than ever to read text, and, and, and especially in preparation for a college or career mm -hmm. readiness. It doesn't matter if it comes in the form of a textbook or it's digital learning. Um, there are lots of different ways to have access to close reading and text-dependent analysis, which is new with Common Core. And it is important, I think, I'm, I'm writing an ungodly number of papers now at the end of the semester, and knowing how to pull that information out of a text. But now so many of these texts are online, it's identifying a, a source that's proper and then getting the information from that. But that's a different story. If you guys can reflect on, I guess, this idea of having classroom sets, and maybe if that could work, and we can meet the goals we need to meet, I mean, that's a savings of hundreds of thousands of dollars when it comes to replacing books over the course of years. Um, would, it be, would it be okay to move on at this point? Yes. I want to see, try to get to as much as we can. Um, I did have an idea where I, I was speaking with Rich, and he had a thought. I don't want to take credit for this. We do curriculum writing here in house. Uh, I didn't hear it. Oh, you brought that up. Okay. Uh, just wondering if maybe there's a way we could pool our resources with other districts if we can become a leader on that. I, I won't rehash that conversation if you had it earlier, but I'll listen to the recording. Mr. Harris, maybe you can well, give a brief. Well, I could tell you, I'm good at brief. Basically, we looked at the science this morning and realized that the three elementaries weren't weren't aligned. So we brought everyone in together in the same room and we worked on getting aligned ourselves first. Then once we're aligned, we yeah. could take it out and show that this is what we're doing, what are you all doing? And then we could look at best practices, common alignments, and things like that, because we weren't all aligned. And that's a big problem, because that's something we've been talking about, Mr. Basil's brought up in the past. Even at the high school, classroom to classroom, you could have a, uh, I think the health classes. Back when I was in 11th grade, we had to take health courses. 
Um, and some of the classes, it was pretty much you do a crossword puzzle for homework, and then the other course, it's you have to memorize 50 terms and then write an essay on it, like that type of stuff, even classroom to classroom. So I guess that is a point. We need to get our own house in order before Absolutely. we try to export. And we started that. We started to work on curriculum, instruction, and common assessments, which hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. okay. That sounds great. I really appreciate the administration taking us in that direction at this point in time. Mr. Repka? I just think two things. One of the things you have to keep in mind, too, is that when people need to get together to uh, write the curriculum, they're writing on the basis of the resources that they have worked on. So when you start talking about comparing your curriculum writing to what Wilson does, Mifflin does, Oli does, the starting point is the resources that we have to work with. And if there's not some general agreement across the county, that we're all going to work with the same resources. Here. Even though the concepts remain the same, the resources still have an influence on how you, write, how you articulate the curriculum. I think that's a testament right. to what Mrs. Kiesel was saying earlier, how we need to be driven by curriculum as opposed to letting the resource. I, I, I don't want to words here. I, I, don't, I don't think it drives it, I think it influences it. So I said, I think the reason that individual schools write their own curriculum is because they want to account for, even though we all agree, these are the standards, these are the objectives, the benchmarks, and so forth, yeah. these are the things that we work with in order to reflect how we're going to get there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, even something between people using common diagnostic tools versus someone doing uh, study island uh, foresight, you know, what yeah. are they doing for progress monitoring? All of that might be dependent upon what you're putting your money into for resources. I would like to see if we, in terms of goal setting, I mean, there, are, there are goals and then there are stretch goals. I'd like to know what school districts, what, what's the school district that we aspire to emulate when it comes to this type of stuff? When it comes to, for example, history, do we aspire to, to be to be Wilson? I'm not sure. If we could, I, if we could look at how schools that are doing something that we want to do do it, though, and going back to influence and keeping it. And I, that's what I've been doing. I'm looking at Wilson in particular. Um, you, you want to look at student achievement, and, but you have to at the same time you have to consider your yeah. uh, fiscal yeah strengths. Yeah. So. All right. That's a good idea. Well, seeing as we talked about that, thank you, Mr. Efka, earlier. We can move on then to item two. I just wanted a brief update. This came up at the last meeting at the high school. We found out that um, some of the literature classes were requiring students to purchase textbooks on their own. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to hear, has that problem been resolved um, Not for next year? Or do we need to spend more time talking about how to make it happen? It hasn't been resolved yet because the budget has not been finalized, but the principal, Mr. McKnight, has put in his budget the funds to purchase those extra, the extra reading material. So... Do we know what that number is? Oh, uh, we went through it in budget. I don't know, okay. but it, but it's enough to cover the extra... Was it an eye-popping figure? No, okay. no, 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 no pop. Why no is it no pop? Okay. So. Is it safe to assume then that the, the kibosh was put on that practice for now so that we're all on the same page with that? We don't expect the students to purchase their own materials going into next year? The teachers know that. Do they know that? I do not know if the teachers know that. And speaking with Mr. McKnight, he said he only wanted them to assign the books that they already had. Okay. So. It sounds like he made that clear. That is our intention, right? Yeah. That's what we're trying once, to get. Once we obviously purchase these, that will be the reason for We can add schools. on to the reading list, but he, from what I was told and what he told the teachers, only assign the books that they already okay. had. Okay. So, and this is one of his projects where he does not want students so to pay done. for it. Right? That, I would say and that's, that's good. Done. That he has that in yes. budget. That should be done in this committee, I think. Yes. And I wouldn't expect to hear any students have telling us next year that they had a purchase to take. All right, item three, the Daniel Boone High School Aquarium Project. Mr. Hurley. Elf is like 11 years old. I don't know. 
Could you pick me up? Are you okay? Is this a good time? Yeah. Active quote. All right, I'll try to be brief here, guys. Um, Basically, our high school wants to build a captive coral reef um, as part of their AP uh, environmental science course and also as part of a proposed club. Um, I think this provides us with a very unique opportunity to partner with the post-secondary institution, Rosemont College. These are the types of relationships that we want to foster um, and build. Uh, Rosemont College has chosen Daniel Boone as someone they'd like to foster, they'd like to do this with. Um, specifically, uh, Rosemont is prepared to make a substantial donation in terms of man hours and um, equipment to help us out with this project. Um, what they're willing to do is they're going to provide expertise with their professor to train our teachers and our students in terms of how to, how to build a coral reef. Um, they're also going to provide us with lots of used equipment, which has significant financial value to our school district. Um, they're going to show us how to use them. Um, and then more importantly, the academic piece of this is that once this reef is up and going, uh, we're going to use it as part of real scientific study. Uh, one of the things we want to try to do is we want to do science in our science classes, not just read about science. We want to actually conduct real life, um, real life science, and they're going to do that in partnership with the college itself. Um, in order to do this, if you take a look at the proposal in front of you, what we would need um, from the school district um, is first uh, just a general approval to go ahead and partner with Rosemont College and they will give us the free material. Um, there's lots of high schools that want to do this with them. They've chosen us, um, but we wanted to go through this formally with you guys because it's the right thing to do from a procedure standpoint. Why did they choose us? Uh, because of our green team's reputation and we've achieved national recognition. So they're real confident in Mr. Harwood's ability to make this type of project go forward in a real positive and productive way for both the college and we've done large-scale projects like this in our STEM programming so far uh, with the green team so that's what why is they the status of the green team? what's that the status of the green team uh, it's, it's still in existence okay. um, they're not quite as active as they were before um, I think they're gonna be doing more this spring again um, but they're not quite as active as they were before um, basically what they're doing um, we're gonna create a coral reef you can see um, in the proposal itself there's some detailed um, things in terms of how it relates to our AP science curriculum. If you look at page four, in multiple ways, like I said, they're going to be doing some scientific study in the AP course itself. Um, unfortunately, um, the AP science class is not going to be enough. You have to maintain a coral reef also. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into that. That's why we need to create a formal club, um, like an after-school club, to maintain the reef itself, to clean the tank, to do all the things that go, to maintain the filtration system, things of that nature. Um, and that'll be after-school. The science will really be done in school, um, but the after-school stuff, um, we'd like to create a club. Mr. Harwood has volunteered to do the club for free for us, um, so that's a real positive thing for us. Uh, going forward, but we would like to formally create that club, and I guess that's what I'm asking you guys to do is to bring that forward as a curriculum committee uh, to the club itself. Like everything um, in life, there are some costs associated with it, and I do want to be transparent about this. Um, it will cost to start this up. Um, there will be a cost between about $600 to about $1,500 of startup to get the um, the live animals and things like that for the aquarium. I have reached out to the foundation, um, and they haven't formalized this yet, but they are very eager to try to help us out in terms of funding that. So I'm very confident between the yeah. foundation, the fish stores, and everyone else that we can get involved, that we can cover the, the, the minor startup costs that will be on the school itself. Um, also, from a very practical standpoint, because like there are costs associated with everything. Um, there's, there's a, you have to maintain the aquarium year after year after year. There's consumables. We have consumables in science class, um, like Bunsen burners and things that go. There will be consumables with this project also that will run about four to five hundred, six hundred dollars a year. We'd include that in our AP science budget. But there, in any type of experimental science course, you're going to have that type of thing. Um, so basically, we're pretty confident we can cover the original startup for the school. Rosemont College is going to provide expertise as well as a substantial contribution to us in terms of equipment, uh, which is huge for us. It's a real good opportunity to partner with post-secondary institutions. Um, again, we're doing science rather than just reading about science, which is much better for learning, as we all know. Um, 
what I'd ask her for, from you guys is basically permission to go ahead and uh, partner with Rosemont College. They're looking for an answer from us. And probably the second piece to go to the full board is I'd like to um, create an official club so we can do it the right way um, and make sure we have a club well, section. In terms of even the partnering, we'll no. need to go to the full board. Okay, that's because fine. the committee is something we need to keep in mind. We have no authority to that's do anything. Fine. I mean, if the, administra the administration can do stuff, we can recommend stuff to the administration, but when it comes to this committee's authority, it has to go to the board. What's going to happen in the summer? Okay. Where and the club will maintain that, okay, and Mr. Harwood will maintain that, um, so they, they will take care of that during the summer. Like the green team does work during the summer, okay. they will also maintain it during the summer. Is there any way we could combine the green team? And the the green, team is, green team has already agreed to make some financial contributions to this project, so they're kind of working hand in hand a little bit on this. So well, it isn't, may. It, isn't it all like the district's money? What's that? The, mo the, the funding. It's not like the green team's pile. I mean, we've had this issue in the past, I think, where you have these people thinking that it's their pile of money, their pile of money. Yeah. It's all the our, our different, our, our activity funds, the student activity funds are basically divided up. If you have the key club, they have an account for that, the green team. Mm -hmm. The green team's obviously, I mean, it is all the district's money, you're correct, um, but they're, they are, they're so very the willing fiduciary. to help out. Yes, yeah, it's an accounting okay. thing more than anything else. All right. My concern, my concern is um, the uh, again, it's an AP opportunity. Will the club be more inclusive to Jenna kids, or will it be like an exclusive club? Just will it just be an exclusive club? The, that's a great question. It should be opened up. The club itself should be opened up to the entire student body. Obviously, there's kid, kids who take AP environmental science are predisposed to enjoy that type of subject. So there will be those members in there. Um, but that would that should be opened up to the entire nice, student body. Yeah, to have some exposure for absolutely. Yeah, I think as a as a general rule, none of our clubs at the high school or at any level should be exclusive. Should be. Nope. But that has happened in the past. Yeah. Yeah. They're by invitation only and only. That's a fair question. I just yeah. know that. Oh, yeah. I'd like true. to get away from that practice. Yeah, absolutely. Want spell that out we want to expose as many students as we can to the coral reef and the educational benefits. So uh, appreciate that. Rosemont provide ongoing support then? Yes, they're, they're willing to provide ongoing support and ongoing training right. for this project. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, you might not my, my mind tends to go on tangents. So I can see a senior prank or some kind of Kid coming in and destroying the coral reef, or how is it going to be protected? <laughs> uh, it, we're locking key in the, in the room. That's the same way we do with the uh, green. Okay, so it'll, it'll be set up in a dedicated area. Yeah, the plan security. right now, my understanding from talking to Sid, is to house it in the area where the green team does their stuff, which is pretty secure because there's a lot of important stuff in there also. But when you're dealing with kids, there's always risks of kids being kids and stuff. Have we considered partnering with the food service providers? We get some lobster in there. <laughs> no, my my actual question, I guess, what's in this for Rosemont? Um, the scientific study part of it, they're they're doing a comparison to. They're also creating a coral reef at their university, and some of it and it involves a comparison study, and oh. somebody synthesizing real data that we collect versus the data that they have. Okay. Well, so any, it's pretty good stuff, guys. Yeah. So they'll actually be on Roosevelt College will be on site at various points. Yes, they're the going program. to. The professor in charge will come, and he's he's already working with Sid a little bit just in terms of giving him information. Mm -hmm. um, but he's going to train our not only our teacher, um, but um, students also to the extent necessary to help us be successful in this. Is that Dr. Ulrich? Yes, it is. And has have the reconsideration has the reconsideration made to our infrastructure? Um, our electric service or online we're okay our electric service and everything's okay um, mr. Harwood is very that in terms of creating the tank itself um, he, he can do the electrical piece in terms of getting the lighting wired up because I think it's a, with when you're dealing with coral reefs my understanding is it's a special type of lighting it's not just like that kind of lighting you put over top of the um, fish itself but he's very adept at that type of stuff he's gonna make sure everything's safe too dealing with water and electricity yeah, yeah. yes Yes. And then the pool, is it a tremendous impact as far as the electrical usage? Is that, is it really I think, I think it's, it's, it's relatively insignificant in the, in the building's oh. electrical use. Something I mean, there will be some, but if you look in the uh, packet itself, the expenses are pretty much detailed, even down to like the fresh water, which most people would normally skip that, but uh, even fresh water is detailed into that. Well, something I, from my experience at the high school, and uh, I hope this has changed since, there can be wild swings in temperature 
um, mm -hmm. between the winter and the summer. It could be pretty chilly in the winter, and if schools are closed for Christmas break, for example, I'm sure we're not heating them to the level that we are uh, when students are present. These um, coral reefs are typically found in tropical environments. Yes. So that's something just yes. to be We have to be of. very sensitive to that, obviously, yeah. for the animals' sake, too, yeah. in terms of maintaining the water temperature. I don't yeah. want to see us heating the whole building, though. Yeah, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> just something for you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. To make sure we're putting it in the right spot. Sounds like a plan. We'll do that. And I hope the committee will get an invitation to see it. And Sounds good. It does take a couple months because it's um, it is you're dealing with the type of environment. It takes about four to five months to get it up. You have to put fresh rock in there or live rock they call in there, live sand in there. Um, a lot of the filtration, my understanding, comes from the live rock and live sand, uh, which is a natural filtration system. Mm -hmm. There is also, I mean, there is a mechanical piece to it, but the goal is to use as much uh, natural fil filtration as you can when you do something like this. You were the in-house expert. You have an in expert <laughs> in this. I really appreciate that. Mr. Well, is there any further discussion on this? I don't think the costs are not extreme. I, I mean, a few hundred dollars. I think the value yeah. is all right. You know who's taking care of the school. tank? You know who's taking care of the tank in the summer, though, right? The kids still. <laughs> <don't care. laughs> all right. So I'll take. Okay, can we bring that to the full Thank board? You. Yeah, we'll take that to the full board tonight. I don't. I don't know if we'll be voting on these recommendations tonight. Okay, that's fine. Is there any time sensitivity as far as Rosemont is concerned? Um, I'd like to. We'd like to at least give them a tentative, like this looks real good, that type of thing, as soon mm -hmm. as we can. Um, okay. The sooner the better. Um, they are leaning on us a little bit for a final decision. But. All right. Well, next up, and this is something I would like to make a recommendation on, recommendation on if, if we're ready, but we've been talking about employee recognition a little bit or for a few months in this committee, and I just on my own whipped together something that I would like to see um, for employee recognition. It's about two pages. I emailed it out to the committee earlier um, looking to give out five awards each year four teacher or employee of the quarter awards, and then one teacher or employee of the year. Uh, they would be nominated by anybody in the community on the website, anybody can nominate. Uh, and they would be selected by the administration, I guess in consultation with the board. Uh, the winner would be invited to a board meeting to be recognized. We'd hear a little bit about their achievements, what they've done to earn this honor. And I did, and we can discuss this. Um, under awards, there'd be a certificate, and then for teacher of the quarter, I was thinking a one-time bonus of $250, and then for teacher or employee of the year, a one-time bonus of $500. I think that's reasonable. If, if we can highlight people in our school district who are doing great jobs, or role models for students and staff and community, I think this could be this could go a long way toward building goodwill. Uh, Does it need to be financial? What about just a plaque or a wall of? I think, I think it would be good to give out. I, I don't know. I mean, a, we give out certificates all the time. I think there is something to be said for the monetary thing. Um, that's just a personal preference, I guess. I don't know what other people think. I'd like to hear the administration weigh in on it because I, I'm concerned about uh, implementing the implementation of it four times a year. It just seemed a little Much. ambitious for me, and I just thought maybe I would like the the uh, administration to tell us how you know how feasible it is to do this, and you know I think we should scale back to uh, you know, four rather four semesters and one uh, year. It just seems a lot to implement. Well, I'm all for a teacher of the year, and I was also working at looking at doing, starting in January, a teacher spot or an employee teach slash teacher spotlight for each of the board meetings, where we'll, we'll select one school each month to be highlighted, and the principal of that building could bring forth an employee of the building who's doing something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. To be presented. So, say it's the um, aquarium project in, in January, if it didn't mm -hmm. freeze over, or um, you know, any project. I mean, it, or it could be students doing something. Just highlighting the building, highlighting what's going on in the building, and somehow putting together, which I think is a great program, nominating 
an employee slash teacher of the year. Yeah. Right. And what that person gets, I don't know. Maybe it's a dinner someplace or we do something in here that's catered. I, I don't know. Teacher, are you thinking the teacher of the year would be one from the pool of those that were spotlit through the year? Well, it doesn't have to be. It, it could be someone who's doing something that's really innovative, like bringing a, a project or a partnership to the district that didn't exist, or just does anything above and beyond. Um, I And this is the question that I emailed back earlier, because I, I got this earlier. I asked, would the teacher of the year be one of the four quarter, would have to be one of the nominated four people? And he's, he was like, no. So I like the spotlight, shining a light on something, yeah. picking a school. Well, we, we go to you know, high school, middle school, elementary, 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 and then we kind of loop back around. And then through that, maybe through that spotlight, it's chosen. Or maybe someone's doing something that's not really a, a superstar thing, but they, they've been consistently great. Mm -hmm. And that's the teacher of the year. Or, or somehow they touch the student mm -hmm. in a way. You know, maybe the students not have a nominating process also. I don't know yet, but I would like to highlight schools and staff members starting in January monthly at, at one board meeting. I love that idea. And, and, and then, and, and not paying them, just I having them just do a presentation of what they're doing and presenting something. And then maybe at the end of the year, we do a, a bigger dollar award. Maybe, maybe it's $1,000 at the end of the year for Teacher of the Year and a plaque that can go to the school with their name on it. And we put, you know, no one sees this building, maybe in, in the high school or another building you where know, they could see. Be, going along with what I want to present next, we could have a listing. Like, I know at the high school we do murals. We could have the teacher's name listed and have a running list of 2010 Teacher of the Year, 2011, mm -hmm. going back in time. Mm -hmm. but, that would be neat. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I do you want to thank, thank Mr. Gersh for, for with us. Yeah, I do. I did appreciate it. Nice but, uh, I did confirm with the IU that they do the employee of the month. It's $25, just, just to get to uh, uh, board of quarters, I believe. Oh, uh, only 25 25 I thought it was well, they, they, they employee a month. Okay. So, you know, we're $87 million uh, now. Like, I keep it in perspective. No, I, I, no, I wasn't sure. I, 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 I have to say monetary is nice. Mm -hmm. Stick is nice, but, you know, recognition, but have a little money behind it. It's nice, too. It's, it's $250, good much, I don't know. But, and I was in agreement. I, I don't know if we need to have that. Four quarters and, and the year, uh, and that was something that I struggled with. I yeah. wasn't sure. I thought yeah. I thought that four might be a bit too much, but then I thought, how do you divide up three oh, out yeah. of the course of the year? We're going to have a spotlight, um, but the, my, my only concern is that if we only have one one quarter a year, then it might exclude all the other employees. Might just be a teacher, and we, we do have other employees besides teachers, so I don't want that getting forgotten about. And, you know, it's just the teachers get, get the, they get the big contract and they get the, the, the award. So those are going to buy two cents. May I add to the conversation? Um, I don't know how many of you were here when Mrs. Trainer was here. <laughs> but what she did was she had a superstars program that's similar, sounds similar. And um, you would receive a little note from her and a little pin, but I thought the neat part about it was they would purchase a book for one of the school libraries mm. and put a nameplate in it, and mm. your name was in that book. So it's just another idea. Yeah. If we want to incorporate funds into it in the future, maybe I'm for one, I'm for spotlights and one uh, recognition at the end of the year, personally. Well, could we then? At the very least, we get a nomination form up on the website mm -hmm. and get the process rolling for this. I'll report back to the full board if, we'll, if there's going to be any money involved with the Teacher of the Year thing, or even if we're interested in the Teacher of the Year program, that will need full board approval. But I think it should be just a token so it doesn't become like a super competitive thing. And I want it to be competitive. I want our teachers working hard to, and not just our teachers, but our staff. I want them to, to try to do the absolute best they can. And, I think most of them do. No, I'm not yeah, saying they're not. They no, no, no. That, that's, that's mischaracterizing what I'm saying. There is positivity in competition. When you see people excelling and you want to excel, I think there's a, a natural drive there. I think, Mr. Yeah, Kirsten's trying to say is if we, we could throw some merit reward into a contract that we don't, can't have merit reward in. Hmm. Kind of, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Well, I think we could have merit in the contract, but that's another story. Well, uh, <laughs> highly, highly difficult to get it. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> uh, 
All right. I, I hadn't seen your proposal, but it sounds like a good one. Yeah, it's, I, I want to see something. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot. I, I've been reading, and I'll, I'll keep this very brief, but there's a lot. <coughs> when it comes to making decisions, there's the idea stage, there's the implementation stage, and then there's the review stage. And we tend to spend a lot of time in the idea stage. But we need to spend more time, I think, in the implementation phase. We talk and talk and talk, but we don't really put things into, into action. And I want to start doing that. And from there, we'll be able to make changes if we need to. But we can't be afraid to, to do stuff. Well, again, I would just like to see the um, administration's version of this to make sure that we're not pushing something down from the top that is not in practice you know, very well, I mean, I, when I look at this, even if we were to, to implement this, I don't think it would be a, a huge burden. Mr. Basil? My hand's getting tired. I had to put it down. Um, I threw this out many, many years ago in a Revenue Enhancement Committee meeting. It's similar to this uh, in a sense that uh, in our organization, we paid people to submit uh, good ideas and bad ideas, a dumb idea, so to speak. So everybody got paid for an idea. And it went into a box, and they got paid two bucks or whatever it was. And you got some pretty ridiculous suggestions at first, but uh, those suggestions that were adopted, people got a hundred dollars. And those ideas came from all over our organization. And um, you know, the first couple of weeks we did it, we got some pretty ridiculously dumb ideas. Uh, but as those were vetted and we would talk about them, people realized that we were pretty serious about this, and then they started to put together some better ideas. And it could be simple things from a secretary saying, hey, look, if I organize my day this way, I could be more productive. Or, hey, if you cut the grass in this pattern on the field, you're going to get done 15 minutes sooner, or whatever it may be. And so everybody's got a better way. They, they do their job every day, and they can all think of more efficient, productive ways of doing their job. But sometimes they're afraid to throw that idea on the table and uh, for being ridiculed or whatever it may be. And, and just a way of encouraging and recognizing those really good ideas that then rise to the top. Um, and those, again, people get the accolades that you're looking for, and that helps motivate them to improve the process. So just throwing that out there as a tangent to this conversation of recognizing hard work, um, it worked for us in our organization. Yeah, I had, when I was on the Revenue Enhancement Committee a long time ago, I, I remember thinking, you know, a way, this was back when we were facing some very difficult finances, that there are people out in the public who were in the schools or in the system, anybody, if you can identify something that's going to save us $10,000, why don't we give you a cut of that? I mean, that's $10,000 we would have we wouldn't, we would have spent otherwise. I don't know. I think they do that in some in private industry. All right, well, moving on from there, if the administration could put together, I mean, I have this little template going if you want to take some ideas you like from it or if you just want to um, start from scratch. But if we can get something on paper and get something moving, again, implement something, we, if it doesn't work out the first year, we could we can hone it and we can tweak it moving forward. But I think it's better to do something good as opposed to talking about doing something great. Um, all right, are we good on that? I'm good on it. Next up is something similar in this recognition, recognition theme. Uh, at the high school, I know in Pottstown they have what they call the alumni honor roll, and they'll induct four or five people each year who are graduates of Pottstown High School, and they'll come back, and it's around homecoming time, I think, and there'll be presentations, and they'll give speeches. It's a way to recognize people who have gone on from that school and have done big things in the community and business and whatever field they choose. And I think it would be nice to do something similar to DBHS. I know we have a music wall of honor and a sports wall of fame, or music wall of fame. And I thought it would be nice to have one for the whole school. Originally, I thought maybe an academic wall of fame, but I think something uh, Mr. McKnight and I were speaking, and we determined that wall of honor might be a better name than wall of fame. Uh, but the purpose that I identified would be to recognize achievements of DBHS alumni in order to inspire current and future DBHS students to instill school pride and to demonstrate the power of the Daniel Boone Area School District education. And what I was thinking is that each year, the administration, is everything all right? Okay. Each year, the administration would um, identify maybe between two and five, whatever the number is variable. Um, 
Daniel Boone High School alums who have gone on and done great things in their fields and they would come to the board and the board would name these people to be Daniel Boone High School alumni, Wall of Fame. And then at the high school we could have like a mural almost like we were, I think Mr. 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 McKnight and I talked about this and he's not here tonight for conferences, but we have murals at the high school now and I was thinking you could list the names, you could list the graduation years. And then um, some of these alums, they have now they're connected to the district. They'll be added to this wall. There's that connection. We establish that relationship. And perhaps if it's a business person, a business teacher could pick up the phone and say, hey, I know you're a Daniel Boone alum. You're on the, the wall of honor. And we're teaching about this subject in my business class. And I'd love for you to come and give a guest presentation. Well, now you have somebody who's coming back into the school system that made them really in the way who they are. And we have that connection. We were talking a few meetings ago about um, the, the owner of the Exeter Dairy Queen, Dairy Queen, Mr. Cadre, Cadre, I, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, and how we could recognize him. And I was thinking some, something similar would be this honorary blazer program, where if you do something great for the district, and even if you're not an alum, you could be added to this wall of honor as an honorary blazer if you give back to the district in a major way. Um, but again, just a thought. I, I think that if we can, I know Mr. Basil, when he, um, a few years ago, this alumni network, the board yeah, tried to start. Kind of my, my question, actually, maybe from Mrs. Bice, too, is does this tie into the uh, Blazer Foundation? Because uh, if I remember correctly, weren't they supposed to try and build this database on one by up and uh, try to contact them? And, I don't know if, if, if part of that was finding out where they're at in their careers and life and, and whatnot, but maybe that, maybe this ties in better with the Pleasure Foundation? Huh? It might, and I had that idea. This is something I've been talking about since I joined the board, and ideally, I guess, would be a non, if the foundation could do it, that would be great, but the way I look at it, you know, I, I'm on the board, and this is something, an idea I had, I, I, yeah, I wanted yeah. to bring it here. I was wondering, if, if, if uh, the maybe foundation I should... Could, could mm -hmm. manage it better because they have the alumni contacts already. Work. Do you want me to check with the foundation at their next meeting or whatever? Yeah, if, if there's something they could do. Something they could run with. If they could do it, I don't know. I haven't. I don't want to say anything negative about the foundation, but I haven't heard much from them lately. So I, I don't want to give them something on their plate that if they have. If they have a plate, I don't want to add. I do believe they are starting to move again. You know, there was a void there to be filled. And Yeah, if it's something they can do. But again, going back to taking ideas and turning them into action, that's really what I, if, if it's ready, I mean, I want to, I'm not ready to, to move this forward personally. I want Mr. McKnight to come away. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, it's going to be a month. We're going to buy them. And yeah, the ideas are like a sound one. Yeah, and if not, then I guess we'll come and address it. We'll come back yeah. here and address and it. Obviously, you want, you want to tie into the graduates, but we've gone around to the sciences. Yeah. Maybe they're, they're, you know, we have, uh, you know, maybe have a, an astronaut down. Back and I think it's a huge or, or, or military. Commence, yeah, I mean, this is free talent. The, the yep. This is free talent that we can utilize yep. by giving them. It's a huge void in the district, and our, our new, our young graduates yeah. are, are, would be inspired. Mr. Harris would not think that those kind of people inspire yep. the, the kids to actually get motivated and achieve. So. Well, I can tell you that Mr. McKnight and I have had this conversation every time I walk into the high school, and I walk into the empty foyer. All it has is a security desk. I said, this should be your Hall of Fame. Yeah. So if it's awards, if it's alumni, it should be a mixture. I went into the band room, and all the trophies were stacked in the back wall. You would never know walking in, doing business with the school, yeah. that you're an award-winning school. It's empty. So we need to bring those things to the front. So if it's down the hall, in the front foyer, redesigning that with murals and awards, so that we could highlight and people come through the front door because I don't often go through the back band room door. <laughs> but you walk in, you see that wall of awards. It's like, wow. You walk into the back athletic department, you see the, all the pictures. You're like, wow, why is it hiding in the back closet? Mm -hmm. It's like putting your Oscar in the closet underneath your sneakers. Yeah. You put it up front so people can see it. Is that where you keep in. your Oscar? I'm still working on it. <laughs> is this yeah, something that you would like to run with then yourself? Yeah. I, I, branching off the wrong way down the Blazer Foundation? No, I think the Blazer yeah. Foundation financially, because when I was talking to Mr. McKnight about just how it should look in the design, it will take some redesigning in the front. 
So it, that's a multiple. That's multiple sources. Yeah, but I, 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 I'd be happy to go with this. All right. Well, there is a starting point at the very least. Moving on now to something that Mrs. Bice, I'm not exactly sure what this is. C and I reporting. Um, can you go to the next one I'll, so I can set up my links? Quick. Okay. Uh, this will be a really brief one, at-risk kindergarten update. I mentioned after the teachers made the presentation, I said I was going to keep this on the agenda every month just so we could hear what the status of it is. And that's what the purpose here is. What, where are we with the at-risk kindergarten? I have on here as a note that we want an up or down board vote before March. So it can and be we're, we're going to need a budget. So yeah. we're going to say we're going to run with one class of 15 students. So that's something. Has there been any movement? Yes. Okay. There you go. Okay, so um, what I did was review the presentation that the two kindergarten teachers made for at risk kindergarten, um, and I do think they did an excellent job. I uh, looked at some of their data, and I also looked at some of our in-house data that we have acquired since the presentation. And um, what's interesting is we do dibbles, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's an assessment that... Uh, that Number of words per minute that students can read, right? Well, that's one part of it. Yeah. But um, what it does is... It's a needs assessment that we have to do through Title I for reading. So we do it on all students, K through 5. Now we looked at the data K through 2 and compared the two different schools, Monocacy and Amity. And what we found was um, children at, uh, and what I do is look at it from a district level perspective. In the past, we've always looked at it from building perspectives. Um, what I saw was in kindergarten there are 41 students who scored intensive. Now, when you get your dibbles report, it comes in your children are grouped in intensive, which is the lowest, uh, the most struggling students. Strategic, who are students that just need a little more help, and. Um, I believe it's called core students who, if you keep doing everything that um, there usually are students who you don't have to worry about. And it's all predicated on the risk or um, the success that they will have with reading in third grade. So looking at it from a district perspective, there were 41 students in kindergarten who scored intensives. And I'm not going to pass it around, it's pretty labor intensive, but I have the data right here if anybody wants to see it. Um, the red illustrates intensive. So these are the children who our core program is not working for. Um, they need additional support in some form, uh, should be research-based programs or interventions. Maybe you want to consider that for an at-risk kindergarten class. When? So these students are tested in kindergarten? They are tested in kindergarten. They are tested three times a year. Okay, this so is cumulative at the end of the year? No, this is the fall data. So it's really not that our program is forming for them, it's just right. they're not ready. Absolutely. Okay. As a matter of fact, they haven't gone through great our program. Things, um, they're just coming in with me. Okay. Very neat. Um, so this is, would be bringing them up to speed to where they should be. That's the point of after kindergarten. Yes. Take these students. We have, now, how would we identify them? Well, we have that data, and we also this year, since the um, kindergarten presentation, I asked some different districts what they were using, and they were using different dance. And I think that was in that PowerPoint presentation that the two kindergarten kindergarten teachers presented. The Brigance, we tested each student in kindergarten in May as they were coming in, and we collected the data from those tests. So we had two groups of data. We had the Dibbles Needs Assessment and the Brigance Screener, which would enable us to identify who the neediest students are. Um, after I analyzed the data, what I found out was in kindergarten, there are 41 students 
on a district level who came up as being intensive. They, they, they really are going to need a lot of support to be proficient in reading by third grade. 32 of those students are at Monocacy Elementary Center. Nine of those students are at Amity. So, you know, whether grade one things improve a little bit more, but in grade two, um, it's the same type of thing. Grade two, 34 students come up as needing intensive uh, support. And at Monocacy, it's 24 students. And at AEC, there are 10 students. Now, are these students the same as the year before? Or do some people go from intensive up to, um, what's the one between four and intensive? Strategic. strategic. Do some move up from intensive to strategic? and some move down from strategic to intensive? Yeah. Sometimes. Depends on your, your instruction. So, so how do we, we identify these kids right now? So how do we help them now in the effort? I, I think we're doing everything we can in a half-day program. Um, okay, what, are, what are we doing differently? What could we do? What, we do? what, we, what are we doing currently differently for those kids that are doing for the program? Uh, they get reading interventions with our reading specialists, but the problem is there are so many at one of our schools that they're not able to see all the students who struggle. So whether it's you know looking at reallocating the resources we have, or those are just ideas that we might want to consider. Well, as well, then, we kind of did that by realigning because we have all our kindergarten kids and, and at the Monocacy and Burbank to go down at at Monocacy, so we kind of did some of that, right? We did, but I, I don't know if we did anything with reading specialists or. Um, I did check with a lot of districts in the county and what they're doing um, because of budgets, you know, crisis throughout the state, is a lot of them have hired paraprofessionals and the reading specialists are training the paraprofessionals to deliver interventions such as uh, language literacy intervention, which is a really good one. It's for the kids who work with reading specialists, but they still don't get it. They need more intensive support. So, and we have those kids. Right now we don't have the manpower to deliver them. But they can be delivered with a paraprofessional. It's, you know, it's your call. It's something we would look into. But that's just what I found out in. Well, I mean, that might be something we need to look into as a, as a separate possibility to a full day for the at risk. Yeah. We hope I have I think what we need to come with, and, and, and soon, is a, a few different options. You know, option one, we do two at-risk kindergarten classes. Option two is we do one at-risk kindergarten. Maybe option three is we just do the paraprofessionals. Option four is some paraprofessionals and some, and one at-risk. At least see the, what the potential is for the rewards versus what we're going to pay. And, right. Uh, yeah, what I'd like to see, and preferably, at the January meeting, I don't think December is practical. If the administration, if Mr. Harris and his team can come back with a recommendation, this is what we'd like to do, this is how much it'll cost, this is how we propose to pay for it, I think that's what we need. This is the, these are the problems, this is how it solves the problems. Uh, but I'd much okay. rather rely on the expertise that we have and understanding the issues that we're facing as opposed to us just taking one of these. Um, all right, I think we can now move on to Mrs. Bites's presentation. It's going to have to go nope. to the next meeting. Okay, I am interested in hearing about what it actually is. May I just mention one thing? Excuse me. I just wanted to make sure that I did let you know that the textbooks that we're considering are on that table back there to purchase. Oh, the ones that you want to purchase. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you for mentioning that. I have one more item on the agenda here, achievements among non-native English speakers. And this is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. I'll tell you the, where it came from. I was reading Sonia Sotomayor's memoir, which is very good. And she, for those who don't know, is the first Latina ever appointed to the Supreme Court. And she grew up in the Bronx. And one of the issues that she said faced students in the Bronx was um, coming from a Spanish-speaking household, being put into the school system, and being expected to perform at the same level as somebody who came from an English-speaking household. 
And what happened to a lot of students who were perfectly cognitively able to, to, do, to solve the problems they were faced, they were facing, was that because of the language barrier, they were being identified as being handicapped, as not being able to achieve. And I know we are not an urban school district, but I think that might compound the problem because we don't really know that experience. Um, so the point I'm getting at, I want to understand how we serve our students and family population doesn't speak English as their primary language. And I really do not know the answer to that. That's why, that's what I'd like to learn. I can speak to that. Okay. Um, I did look at the uh, demographics of the school district and the different ethnicities. Um, we have a very small, I don't even think it's one here, uh, Hispanic ethnicity, but you know, I don't think it matters if it's how small it is. We do, I agree, we do need to be unique to those learners. And along the lines of the language literacy program that I mentioned that we could use as an extra support to kindergartners and first grade, I believe we had it all the way to the fifth grade. We purchased the kits with some grant money. So we have staff who can use the kits? We have staff, but the kits are very labor intensive. They require a lot of training. And so with a handful of staff, such as our reading specialist, delivering another program, it becomes quite difficult for them to also deliver the LLI program. We do have an ESY teacher, um, Barb Sanchez, who has been using the kit and is successfully with the elementary students. But um, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, my family, my father grew up speaking Italian, my mother grew up speaking Spanish, and um, Fortunately, they did have the support and became very <coughs> successful. So I agree. We do need to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all our students. There's something that also the IU can help out with. Other yeah, yes. I'm sure there are other districts that are facing much bigger challenges in this field than we are. Uh, Just briefly, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting with Lisa Sanchez one afternoon outside of school, and I actually reached out to her. I asked her how well she thought that program was going at the middle school, and she, she said she thought it was a good thing. That was something we were doing well, to be honest with you. And what, what the LLI program does is it really builds on vocabulary that those kids may come to school with not knowing, so that's a big component to the program. Um, and it has little readers that go with it. It's a very good uh, research proven program. And I can also tell you, someone who's worked in urban districts, Two districts ago, I was in the opposite situation where I was the only one who spoke English in an all-Spanish district. And it's really interesting. You learn some interesting words from the kids. But if you realize that the learning, I mean, the, the, the language barrier isn't a learning barrier, that's key. Because they couldn't talk to me and I couldn't talk to them. <laughs> but over time, we, we taught each other. So as long as that's realized, it's fine. It, it's when you realize that someone doesn't speak English, there's not something wrong with them. You just have to be able to reach out to them in their native language and, and teach them. And this transcends spoken word into written word as well. Just the way that the languages phrase different things, where you put the subject in relation to the verb, it has ramifications throughout the educational experience, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. It requires a different mode of thinking. Yes. yes. You have to think in that language to be able to speak it and understand it. So what happens with the younger children is they have to speak in English terms. I was asking for translations that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So you can't just Google, which I did one time over the, over the I, I did the snow closing. Mm -hmm. And I confused escuela and esculo. <laughs> and if you speak Spanish, I just said, your butt is closed <laughs> because of snow. <laughs> so that was an interesting robocall that we had. Yeah, it's so, it's, you know, so you have to speak in that language. But once again, if you realize that it's not a learning disability, yeah. it, it's a language, then we're fine. All right. Well, 
I'm glad to know that we're on the right track there. If there's any data that's available, that would be, I think, helpful. But, all right, on that note, that takes us through the items on the agenda. Is there any public comment on the Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting? All right, seeing none, the meeting is adjourned at 725.